said a few words, so I'm just going to turn it right over to you. Okay. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great, great pleasure. to introduce to you, from the class of 1968 of Georgetown University, President William Jefferson Clinton. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I always like to say that. He's the only president I know who's not term limited at least as far as I know. First, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. And second, I want to congratulate the people who were responsible for putting this forum together. You had an amazing group of panels <clears throat> with some of the most important private citizens and public servants in our country and around the world. I hope I can add a little to this. Usually when I speak to a Georgetown group, I'm in Gaston Hall. But as with so many other things, President Obama took that over from me this week. <laughs> and I thought he gave a remarkable talk about uh, his plans for economic recovery. For whatever it's worth, I think they're good plans and I think they've got an excellent chance to succeed. I speak all over the world, and whenever I give a talk, somebody says, well, when's this thing going to be over? And I always give the same answer, October the 9th at 3.30 in the afternoon, <laughs> to illustrate the obvious point that no one knows. It's impossible to calculate. Uh, there are no known economic models, as far as I know, that will measure both the destructive impact of the wealth that's already disappeared and that which will not reappear even when the stock market comes back and the price of metals and minerals and other things rise. And also, it's impossible to calculate what the combined impact of all the efforts being made around the world to deal with the crisis will be. Uh, they're not exactly coordinated, but they're stumbling in the right direction. I told somebody that the global response to this crisis sort of reminds me of a bunch of people in a bar when the fire alarm goes off. <clears throat> it's not pretty watching them struggle for the exit, but they're all going to get out alive. And so are we. This is a, a really important time, I think, <clears throat> for this forum to be held. <clears throat> there are a lot of things being celebrated in this time period, some wonderful, some terrible. I'm going Sunday to dedicate the Illinois Holocaust Museum. There's been a lot of remembrance of the Rwandan genocide in the last few days. Sunday is the 10th anniversary of the awful school killings at Columbine. <clears throat> and I've been honored to stay in touch with the people involved with Columbine to help them build a memorial. And uh, some of them are going to be in Washington next week arguing for a reinstatement of the assault weapons ban. <clears throat> Unbelievably enough, it appears that the Congress doesn't want to do it in spite of the fact that it would do more than anything else to help the Mexicans combat their terrible problem with violence uh, near the American border, much of which is fueled by the drug gangs having weaponry superior to that of the United States because they can get 50 caliber rifles over the counter at gun stores in America. Otherwise, I don't have strong feelings about this. <laughs> but I think it's also important to note that we're going to soon be observing Earth Day at a time when there is more sentiment to do something about climate change than at any time in the last decade. And an increasing understanding, <clears throat> which <clears throat> excuse me, which I believe is imperative to getting something done, that we can actually grow the economy more rapidly and more sustainably by changing the way we produce and use energy 
than by sticking with what we've been doing. I want to talk a little about what we're here for, this Global Forum on Development, whether it makes sense to do at a time when there's so much of a financial crisis in the United States and in other wealthy countries that uh, it's all we can do to hold the present levels of aid at their current amounts when we have substantial numbers of American foundations actually filing for bankruptcy, when food banks are being overrun in cities throughout the United States, and when hunger is on the rise in the developing world because of the financial collapse. I guess what I'd like to say is I think it's more important than ever that each of us do what we can. Now, the Harlem Children's Zone, which is virtually next door to my foundation's headquarters in Harlem, I think is the best comprehensive child and family development program in the country for dealing with people who are born into very difficult circumstances, help them get off to a good start in school, go through school and perform well, graduate, go into college, or go into the workplace. Almost all their money came from Wall Street. And thankfully, they had cash reserves equal to, I think, a year at least of their budget. And they'll be all right this year. But it would be a tragedy, and it would cost us a lot more over the long run if that program did not continue to survive and to thrive. So the first point I want to make is we can't forget about our responsibilities to people who are less fortunate than we are, even if we are really strapped now. If you look around this room, most of us, no matter what has happened to us since uh, September the 15th, which was really the tipping point for this whole financial crisis, uh, we're better off than 99.9% .9 of the people who ever walked on planet Earth. And most of us are better off than over 90% of the people who live in America now. Indeed, it's Im worth pointing out that before September 15th, there had already been millions of home mortgage foreclosures, and two-thirds of the American people had a, an income after adjustment for inflation that was lower than it was the day I left office. So most people were in trouble before this, even though we're all in more trouble now. 